So it's, uh, it's really interesting for me to be up here today because exactly three years ago, I was sitting in this room while listening to a speaker talk about what sounded like what you'd get if you combined amazing architectural beauty with just pure nonsense. And it's really, it's funny looking back on this because all of what uh, he talked about that day is exactly what I do every day of my life now. And I really love the idea of that, you know, that a, that a chance encounter at a symposium on the artistic side of 3D design could have led to me deciding to make an everyday living out of something, especially something that I get so much joy out of and something in such a, a cool new field, really. And so that new field that I'm talking about is something that's become known as digital fabrication, which more than anything else just means making things using easily accessed high-tech tools. <clears throat> and so I have been, um, so like entrepreneurs often do, I'm somebody who entered into an industry without really having any prior knowledge of it whatsoever. I've been doing digital fabrication ever since graduating from here two years ago, where I studied entrepreneurship and how to start a company. And so our education in the major worked in a pretty unusual way, uh, because basically on day one, we were just told, start a company, you know, just start one. And of course, you, you know, you'd ask, well, hold on, wait a minute, uh, isn't that why we're here in the entrepreneurship major, to, to learn how to start a company? What do you mean? What, how do we just start a company? What do we do? You know, where do we start? And uh, so the answer we were given was, uh, mm-hmm, that's right, yes, you got it, go get him, go ahead. And so, of course, they would teach us too, but it was obviously a real learn-on-the-go kind of situation, you know? And so, I think, uh, thinking about it, I really think that a lot of creative people tend to start like that, really, you know? We always know that we want to do something, we want to do something cool, but oftentimes we really have no idea what that will actually end up being. And I love that, um, because, and the reason for that is because learning to be creative, more than anything else, learning to be creative is purely habit and purely developing the right mentality. Learning to be creative is purely habit and purely developing the right mindset. And so throughout my time this far, you know, starting companies and pursuing different entrepreneurial ideas, my story has been, or my time has been a story of learning how to think in three distinct ways. Thinking like an artist, thinking like an engineer, and thinking like a business person. So that first year when we were told to simply just start a company was definitely a struggle for me, but at the same time showed me how much of a normal thing creativity can be. Um, I think a lot of times the picture that we've been fed of, of the creative person is like this, this picture of like this movie director with like this wild hair, or like this musician who, who maybe looks like he doesn't quite take care of himself all the way, or, or um, well, anyone who looks like they don't bathe or take care of himself really. I really feel like a lot of us have that view, and, uh, and realistically, that's not the case, of course. Anyone can learn to be creative. You know, I find that the more you just learn to keep your eyes open, the more different ideas you begin to have. It's amazing how just having, it's amazing how much you can accomplish just by having this view instead of this view all the time, right? And so, as that first year went on, went on, and I was able to learn how to start listening to the good ideas around me, and maybe form some of my own, I started to see this amazing shift in the way my mind would just latch on to good ideas and keep them there. Over and over, I kept getting drawn back to the idea of customization and personalization within a product. I would think about things entirely unique to a person, such as their name or their personality, or, or going a little deeper, maybe things that uh, would define them, you know, like their, like their fingerprint, or their DNA, um, or their voice. One thing that I'd seen online that really stood out to me was how people um, were making jewelry based off of sound waves and uh, in audio waveforms, you know? And so I really liked that idea, and after a little while came up with um, a uh, company idea centered around preserving sound waves in the form of just audio waveform bracelets. Uh, the idea was to have somebody um, who could go onto my website and just record themselves saying a message, anything really, you know? Um, happy birthday, Grandma, or I miss you, Dad, or I love you. And uh, I wanted to somehow take this message that they recorded, somehow take it and transform it into this three-dimensional sort of rubbery shape that you could give to somebody as a gift. And so I was so excited, you know, I finally had my idea. I told a couple people and they all seemed to like it a, a good amount. And so then I was just faced with that, that big question, you know, I thought, yes, finally, I've got my idea. Okay, what on earth do I do with it? How do I do this? And so uh, having really no absolutely no idea where to begin. I just decided to sit down with different teachers and um, men business mentors that I had at the time. It's really good, to, it, you really need to have people like that that you can go to. And so I just sat down with them. I would tell them about my idea and they'd give me different advice on, 
on how to get them made or, or which investors to go to and, and everything like that, I immediately saw that prototyping this idea would be essential. You really need to prototype anything that you make if you're going to sell it, um, which was especially true of, of such a weird new kind of concept. You know? And so one morning, one of my, my business mentors had taken me out to eat one day, and he asked me, have you thought at all about 3D printing? And this turned out to be a pretty big question to me because of the doors that's opened and the paths I've gone down since then. I think we've all at least heard of 3D printing, right? You know, we've seen you know, those YouTube videos of the 3D printed cars or all of the, the robotics and the, the 3D print prosthetics being made for disabilities and, um, and everything like that. But still, to a lot of people, I found that 3D printing is still a bit of a, a foreign kind of weird concept, you know? Like, how does it even, how does it really work, people will ask me, you know, does it like, does it like fold paper inside into shapes to make stuff, or, you know, is it just magic, you know? Is it, you know, are there little elves running around in the machine making everything for you? Um, spoiler alert, it is, it is the elves. <laughs> um, and so, um, I was immediately fascinated by the idea of 3D printing, by the thought that you could literally picture anything in your head, and that it was possible to tell a machine how to make it for you on the spot. Um, and just really loved that idea. And the, the question was, can I myself actually use this to my advantage for my idea? Or was it still you know, just a little too futury of a concept to really fully take advantage of for someone like me just yet? And after doing a ton of research, which is you know, very important always, I decided that my idea might actually be doable. But I also didn't have any money to spend on the idea, which meant that I was going to have to learn a lot of stuff. <laughs> and uh, in being completely honest with you, a lot of what I've figured out and done since then really just wouldn't have been possible 10 to 15 years ago. And that is because we have so, so many resources right there today just waiting for us to use them. So, so many of them. The problem is a lot of us just don't know that's the case. I mean, even here at our school in particular, we have access to a website called uh, Linda, full of hundreds of different tutorials on any professional software you could name. You know, from things like Photoshop to JavaScript to Sibelius for music or Maya or AutoCAD for 3D stuff. Programs that some of which would cost hundreds to learn in an educational setting, if not thousands to learn, that we have access to anytime we want, wherever we are, just on our computer, just because we want to. So I started using this and started teaching myself a very basic 3D software, a free one, by the way, called Blender, so that I could make some of my, my prototype bracelet shapes. And I will tell you, at first, I mean, they were just so ugly. I mean, just look at that. That's, suppo that's supposed to be a sound wave. Doesn't that, doesn't that just look stupid? Um, but I still needed some prototypes to work with. And so, to get them made, I took advantage of another awesome modern-day resource that we have, um, being um, another website called Shapeways, where what you can do is you can, once you've created this 3D file of something, upload it to them, and they will 3D print it in, uh, and send it to you. It's, which is a great resource, because even 10 to 15 years ago, prototyping was something that was hugely expensive, no matter who you were. I mean, even for my little three-inch bracelet shape, I made, the, I made the mistake of going to one of these old-fashioned pro, um, prototyping companies at first, and they wanted to charge me $200 for what I was able to get 3D printed for, like, 12. So, like I said, I was just fascinated by the idea of 3D printing and just the concept of pure creation coming alive before your eyes, right? And long story short, I ended up getting my own 3D printer, and I realized that I really just love physically making things, you know? Which is interesting, I'd never really known that about myself to, before, to that kind of extent. Um, in fact, the night before my 3D printer arrived in the mail, I was so excited about it that I was, uh, that I was dreaming about it. And, um, and in my dream, it got to my house, and the first thing I made was the, um, the Iron Man arc reactor thing that he has in his chest, <laughs> the, the blue battery thing. And so the next morning, in real life, my 3D printer arrived, and I decided, hey, I need to make something now, so maybe I should do it. And so this was my first ever creation just for fun. And... Um, <laughs> And, and all right, so listen here, you know, the thing about arc reactors, if you're going to make them, you, you don't mess around, you don't play games, you do it all the way, so I decided to make it so that it glows and everything. And, uh, and I realize this is probably the closest I'll ever get to being Iron Man, so I just want to enjoy this. And so, <laughs> so I started making all kinds of cool stuff just because I could and because I loved it, you know? Uh, these are some of my things that I've made. This is my Amon mask, my, my 3D printed exoskeleton glove, exosuit glove, my baby Groot, my Star Lord gun, and my personal favorite by a very significant margin, my Majora's mask. Um, a lot of these things weren't even things that I myself designed, but just files that I found online that other people had shared on another excellent, excellent resource, um, being a site called Thingiverse. Um, so, <clears throat> 
So then what I was really doing, more than anything else, what I was doing was developing a new mindset, a new way of looking at the world. All my life, I'd been an artist. I'd thought like an artist. You know, I'd grown up making videos, writing screenplays, choreographing sword fights with my friends, or drawing little characters. And then all of a sudden, now I was in this world of manufacturing, in, in little annoying little tolerances, and in, uh, in geometry, and really just thinking like an engineer. And it wasn't even so much an intentional shift as it was just a natural progression as someone starting something new. And so around this time, I had the chance to go to that symposium that took place in this room, which was really just a conference on digital fabrication and how art uh, meets 3D design using things like 3D printing and laser cutting. Um, and all of that nonsense, that pure nonsense I mentioned earlier that, as it turns out, may not be quite so far-fetched and crazy after all. Sitting where you're sitting, I learned about something called parametric design. Oh, and this is my, um, my creation from start to finish of my, my waveform bracelets, and so I wasn't quite at that point yet. But I started learning about something called parametric design, which more than anything else just means making things, or it means putting customized input into the form of a product. That's what these artists and designers were doing. They were taking just any type of product and putting custom input into just its form. And it's crazy because this is exactly what I'd been doing with my company Wavelet without even realizing it. I would be taking the custom part, the sound wave, and putting it into the form of the bracelet, of the, of the product itself. Only now I saw how it could be done infinitely easier and quicker using little codes or algorithms that looked something like this. <laughs> and so there are tons of really cool examples of parametric design being done all over the place today. Uh, Nike has been doing it for a while using their custom shoe building website. Jewelry designers use it for things like ring size adaptation and, and fitting their customized products to their specific clients. One though, you guys would really appreciate this I think, um, is this beer company. Um, this beer glass company, and what they do, you give them a sample of your DNA, and they take that and they analyze it, they look for your, ge your genetic predisposition to things like alcohol tolerance and flavor preference, and they use this stuff to literally craft and control and form the shape of a cup that's custom to you based off of your DNA. Pure parametric design, it's, it's absolutely nuts. <laughs> it's just nuts. <laughs> and so, uh, the, the most captivating to me, though, that I saw that day sitting over there was learning how um, architects were using parametric design. I saw some of these pictures that day of these sprawling, organic architectural designs and furniture designs and lighting, all of which were just direct products of these algorithms that people were creating. Even cooler, even cooler than that was the ways that they were um, physically making them or fabricating them, as it's called, since much of it could be done using easily accessed tools, such as CNC routers and, and laser cutting machines. I decided pretty much immediately to start learning how to do this type of design and so I spent the next several months buying a couple things I would need and taking uh, tutorials for another 3D software called Rhinoceros that would allow me to make these codes. I really wanted to see if I could start a company um, around selling some of these designs. Being honest, I really wasn't sure if it would be possible or not, but I really just loved the idea too much not to try it. One of the, um, <clears throat> one of the challenging things, one of the tough things about starting anything new like this can be getting past that initial nagging question, you know, where you ask yourself, you know, can I, can I really do this, or am I just kind of kidding myself here? So it was incredibly satisfying when I finally had my first product to show in the form of a chair that I had designed. Um, I, loved, I loved the relationship that math and nature take on in parametric design, and so I decided to name my company Terraform after the idea of shaping the Earth around us to suit our needs. Since then, I've made a number of other models and designs that are for sale, some, some being um, laser-cut lights and pendant lamps, others being benches and different interior geometric types of fixtures. <clears throat> the thing is, right now is such a ripe time for entrepreneurship. Never in the history of the world have we had just so many resources right there at our fingertips waiting for us to use them. I mean, almost everything I've done, I either did for free or just by figuring it out as I went along. And not because there's anything special about me in particular. You know, I'd like to think there was maybe, but the truth is, I mean, anyone who just has a passion for an idea could have done it and can do it. Um, I just remember, you know, is, is learning these kinds of things always easy? Definitely not. You know, do you see results right away? Absolutely not. But can it be done? Yes. Can even a younger person, like a college student, have an idea that makes money? Absolutely yes. I just remember being in this room and hearing that and having that sink into me for the first time and just the feeling of hope and excitement that I had from it. And if I can pass that on to anyone else, then I will. You know? Just don't let doubt or fear of failure be the thing that stops you if you've got an idea. You know, I say make, your stuff, make yourself step out 
I say go for it. I say give it a try. And if you're more of the business-minded person, I would encourage you, take a little while to just think like an artist. See what happens, you know? Maybe you are more artistically minded. Um, learn a computer language. Try thinking in a technical way, even if it is a little challenging and hard at first. It definitely was for me. I say, find that idea that you love and get to work. Thank you.